Okay, and we're live. So welcome to the second ever edition of the Mindful Stoic Live Book Club. I'm your host, Brecken McRae, the creator of the Mindful Stoic blog. Um, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is just my second live, so I'm still a newbie at this. Expect clumsiness. Expect me to uh, perhaps not see your questions or comments. I'm also live. Um, it's worth noting I'm live on two channels simultaneously on YouTube and Instagram. So essentially today's live book club is tying into a theme that I have been exploring on the Mindful Stoic social channels this week. And um, the campaign, if you will, or theme that I've been going with this week on our social channels has been do good better. And it's also a chance for me to share with the Mindful Stoics audience uh, the Mindful Stoics mission. And that is to make the world a better place. It might seem like a very lofty goal for a blog, and it is. It certainly is. Um, but given that the blog deals in topics of mindfulness and stoicism, and mindfulness being derived mostly from Buddhist wisdom traditions, then I feel it is very fitting to have uh, a mission to make the world a better place. Now, very lofty goal. It is my desire and effort to try to help people with my exploration of the wisdom traditions of Stoicism, Buddhism, and the practices of mindfulness. I do believe that they can help people become more resilient and more peaceful one individual at a time, and that can ripple outward. But another way in which we try to promote our mission of making the world a better place is by supporting nonprofits. In fact, the, the nonprofit that we support actively, unofficially, is called GiveWell. Now, you might be already thinking, what, what is this live stream about? I thought it was about books, book club. Well, it is. I'm just setting that up. So the book that we are going to discuss today is called Doing Good Better by William McCaskill. Let me just pull up the full title of the book because there is a subtitle that I can't remember right now. So the book is called Doing Good Better. So I say all that in the beginning to just say that, you know, the reason I chose this book is because this week I wanted to dedicate all my messaging on the, on the Mindful Stoic social channels to promoting our message of good, um, explaining how we support the charity, the, the, the nonprofit called GiveWell, and why we chose them. And this book is fundamental to that because this book is what led me to, what inspired me to come up with this mission and to promote this mission. And specifically, it led me to um, give well. I had never heard of them before reading this book. So the book, again, for those who are just joining, thanks everyone for joining. It's really nice to have you here for this book discussion. So the book that we'll discuss today is called Doing Good Better. I just pulled up the the Amazon page so I could recall the full title with the subtitle. So the subtitle is How Effective Altruism Can Help Help you help others, do work that matters, and make smarter choices about giving back. Okay, So the book is essentially about effective altruism. And it's, it's something that I didn't know much about before. I can't even remember how I came to discover this book. I think I was just looking for books on altruism. Okay, so... The premise of the book is effective altruism, which, okay, so what is effective altruism? It's basically an honest, impartial attempt to work out what's 
best for the world. It's about making the most difference, the biggest impact that one possibly can. Um, said differently, it's about if, if one is attempting to make a charitable do doma donation, they would want to make sure that, that donation is really truly being used effectively and that it's really going the distance and helping as many people as possible and in the biggest way possible. So that's what this book is all about. It's about effective altruism. So the book opens up with a very interesting anecdote about a nonprofit called Play Pump. So Play Pump came into existence trying to solve a problem. And that's that in some sub-Saharan African communities, water has to be pumped often manually using outdated, broken, unreliable pumps that can be incredibly difficult, um, challenging work for the residents of these villages. And it, it is a barrier to clean drinking water and therefore has a lot of downstream negative health impacts. So basically the problem was that even in communities where there were pumps, some communities lacked pumps altogether but even in the communities that had pumps, the difficulty with which it was to, to get water from these pumps was a barrier to many people having um, many people having um, access to clean drinking water. So what Play Pump did was something really clever. They um, came up with basically those you might remember from your childhood or if you have children today you might remember on playgrounds there were those merry-go-round things that's actually not the correct word for it but these toys that you find in playgrounds where kids run around a circle pushing this circular thing and then they jump on and, and it spins around and around and around and around and so they devised and engineered a version of that that also pumped water. So, you know, kids would be playing around this thing just as they normally would, and but it would be pumping water at the same time, making it much easier for the people in the village to, to get the water. Amazing. Sounds like a great idea, right? Well, it turns out, no. It turns out it was a terrible idea. It got a lot of great press, press coverage. It got a lot of notable... Uh, donations. It was even endorsed by certain celebrities. It got a lot of. It really made the rounds on the on the Western media nightly news because you know it just looks good, right? Kids playing around, playing naturally as they would on this piece of playground equipment, but it's also pumping water. Wow, it sounds really good. And even me as a reader, and the way he that William McCaskill, McCaskill sets this anecdote up in his book, Doing Good Better, even as I was reading it, I was like, wow, this sounds like a great idea, until suddenly he he uh, he gives you the, the wake-up call, the, the reality check, if you will, and says, so like, no, this was a terrible idea, and it did not work uh, for several reasons. First of all, they were very expensive. Uh, once they were deployed in these communities, there was no support. So once they were broken, they were basically done. There was no follow-up support. Um, and also, it was very difficult. It was still very difficult. So it's not like it was fun for the kids playing on this play pump. It's not like it was fun. Plus, the actual fun of these playground merry-go-rounds is that once you run, 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 then it gets going with momentum and you jump on and then you spin freely without using your body. But the, in this case, with this play pump, it didn't function that way at all. It wouldn't keep spinning after they um, ended up with momentum. There, You couldn't gain momentum with it. So basically, he sets the stage uh, of the book with this anecdote about this play pump that sounded really great, but turns out it was a total failure because it's very expensive very ineffective and so he leads this book doing good better for those of you joining now we're talking about the book 
doing good better. It's about effective altruism. And by the way, I need to stop right now too, because I almost forgot on Instagram, uh, I started a fundraiser, right? So the reason I'm cho I chose this book today is because this week I'm dedicating uh, all the mindful stoic communication on social to um, doing doing something good, doing something good for the community. So we are uh, actively we have an active fundraiser on the Instagram live feed in support of the Against Malaria Foundation, which is uh, as we'll get to. Uh, as we'll get to in the discussion of this book, one of the most effective charities there, there are, objectively speaking. So uh, please, if you can, uh, support. I've never actually run a, a, a fundraiser through Instagram, so I don't know how it works or if it's even truly up and running, but it's supposed to be. So if you can, uh, if you have the means, check that out. Okay, so back to the book, Doing Good Better, right? So he opens the book with this anecdote about this play pump that looked good, right? It looked like this merry-go-round merry playground equipment that functioned as a water pump in sub-Saharan African communities that desperately needed them, but turns out it was terrible, did not work. So he sets the stage just to just to make this point. Just because something looks as if, as if it is doing a lot of good, does not mean that it's doing good. And this is very critical in the world of charity and nonprofit and aid. Right? So what's the difference between a an effective charity and an average or poor charity? So he makes this point quite early on in the book. And, and well, the difference is enormous. Uh, the best charities, he says in the book, are hundreds of times more effective at improving lives and saving lives than just the average ones or the poor ones. So we're looking at like orders of magnitude of, of difference here in people, really in people's quality of lives. So the author of the book, William MacAskill, and the founders of GiveWell, which is, again, GiveWell is the nonprofit that uh, I've chosen to uh, support unofficially but uh, fully with, with with my modest resources and my modest audience reach from the the blog the mindful stoic uh, give well is the charity that we support and so uh, the author of the book William Macaskill and the two founders of give well are sort of at the roots of this effective altruism movement. And again, I said it in the beginning, but again, just for the people who are joined a little late. Um, so effective altruism is basically an honest, impartial attempt to work out what's best for the world using, using objective truths, measurable realities, the scientific method, and a lot of the, the the most advanced methods in, in economics to really measure and work out how good a charity actually is or how effective a charity actually is okay so um yeah just that's just to point out that the author of this book is really kind of one of the forefathers of this effective altruism movement and okay and so there's also two resources that i want to talk about before we get more into the specifics of the book. And that's um, the author is also the founder of a group called 80,000 Hours. 80,000 Hours is a group for young people in particular, but anyone who, who would like to do good for the world through their career choice and their, and their work. So it's, it's an advisory group that mostly supports young people in their career choices and, and guides them towards careers that match not only their skills, but also um, areas that can have the biggest, most effective impact on, uh, on the world, positive impact in improving and saving lives. And the other resource, I've already mentioned them a couple times, is GiveWell, right? So I've mentioned that GiveWell is the charity that we uh, the Mindful Stoic support. Now, let me explain who, what is GiveWell. What is GiveWell? So GiveWell is a nonprofit organization. They are not a charity in and of themselves. They are a research group. So their mission is to find the charities that are doing the most good every year. 
So they, it's an ongoing mission effort that they do. They're constantly researching, validating with evidence what charities are doing, the real impact. They're measuring it um, objectively. So you can go to the GiveWell website, givewell.org, and one of the first things you'll find are, are the top charities. So they usually limit this list to four charities that they believe not just believe that they have validated and measured uh, to be doing the most good in the world. And, and uh, uh, I should probably pull them up right now. I, I can't recall them off the top of my head. But one of them is the Against Malaria Foundation, the, the charity that I chose as the Instagram fundraiser that I have attached to this live stream right now. Uh, and it, it that they, I, I do remember them. So, I mean, uh, they basically, what they do is provide, uh, mosquito nets because malaria is, is just one of the leading causes of, uh, unnecessary preventable death around the world. And, uh, they have a network distribution for anti mosquito nets, which really have a measurable impact. In fact, GiveWell estimates that um, the cost effectiveness of the Against Malaria Foundation is about $5,000 per life saved. So that's, so they, that, this is how specific they get when they are evaluating charities. Okay, so the other top charities are uh, the Malaria Consortium is another one. So uh, again, it's a malaria-based uh, charity. And this is one that provides preventative med medicine. Then there's Against Malaria Foundation, the one that we have in the uh, Instagram live, which delivers anti-mosquito nets. Then we have uh, one called Helen Keller International, which is basically a vitamin A deficiency uh, prevention program. Basically provides vitamin A. They attribute over 200,000 children's deaths to vitamin A deficiency each year. That's probably something that people didn't know. And this is this is why I've chose this book to share. And, um, and I, I promise I'm going to get back to the book itself in just a minute. Right now I'm talking about Give Well. I learned about GiveWell from this book. The author cites GiveWell research often throughout this book. This is why I'm, I'm mentioning it because, and spending a moment to describe what they are, who they are, because they are the research group that attempts to determine what uh, charities are doing the most good. And so here I'm just explaining what are the top four that they've uh, that they have right now for 2024, and giving you some of the metrics that they that they cite, right? They cite this stuff with evidence. So they also here for the for the Helen Keller International, they say about $2 to deliver a vitamin A supplement. In 2022, we directed funding to Helen Keller International to support this program at an estimated average cost effectiveness of $5,000 per life saved. There you go. Evidence of impact, very strong. So like they, they rate these things on a few different um, criterion. And so here, uh, the fourth one is called new incentives. And this is basically cash incentives for routine childhood vaccinations. Here's another one you probably haven't heard of or you wouldn't have thought is one of the top four most effective charities in the world is actually giving cash incentives to young mothers in, 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 in certain parts of the world to get them to um, that provide routine vaccinations. And again, at, a, at an average cost effectiveness of $5,000 per life saved. So that's what GiveWell does. They are a research group that tell you, the average person like near you today in 2024, what charities are doing the most good objectively, science-based, science evidence-based, who's doing the most good if, you, if you're going to donate how can you save the most lives? And another concept that comes out from the book is that things do happen on the margins. 
you might think that, okay, if I want to reduce beef consumption just globally, right? I think, I think this earth consumes a little bit too much beef. So let me skip, uh, let me skip a steak this week, but you might think that's going to have no impact whatsoever. Skipping one steak. Well, it can on the margin, it can have an impact. And here we're talking about these four top charities. They're all four of them about $5,000 per life saved, right? So your donation could be the five thousand, the five thousand dollar that they needed to save a life. So these things do happen on the margins, and that's why they they provide data like that. Okay. So another point that William McCaskill makes in this book, his book Doing Good Better, is that if most people in the what's sort of generally referred to as the developing developed world are in the top 1% of economic power of the, of the planet right we often hear about in the context of the of the united states is the top 1% being super billionaires but if you take a look at the world population uh, I think I should have made note of this. By the way, I read, read this book quite a long time ago, so I'm struggling a little bit to recall some of the, the salient points. But again, this week I'm dedicating to sort of the message of doing good. Uh, and so I wanted to cover this book in this week's uh, live book club. So you are in the 1%, I believe, if you're making something like above 35000 US dollars per year something like that. You're in the top 1% rich, the top richest 1% of the world. And in 2024, if you are in that top 1%, the economic and technological circumstances of 2024 are such that you have more power than anyone in human history has ever had to do good. Your capacity to do good in this world is like magic compared to the historical precedent. You have more power to do good than most kings ever had in human history. That is a very unique position that we, uh, people who enjoy uh, the benefits that come from often from birthright of living in the developed world or being in that 1% of above like a $30,000, $35,000 a year income have this incredible power, right? Here I maybe talk about, you know, like uh, some people um, might wonder, you know, expect like because my blog, the, this blog, The Mindful Stoic, is about mindfulness, stoicism, uh, Eastern wisdom traditions like Buddhism. So what, what does this have to do with that? Um, but I would argue like everything, it has everything to do with that, right? Um, Stoicism, I believe, and it's not just me who believes this, the ultimate purpose of Stoicism is to make the world a better place, right? In Stoicism, they said that the ultimate goal is to act in accordance with reason and, and that act in accordance with nature and that our nature as humans is this ability to reason and logic and to make good choices when faced with good or evil we choose good character was above all more important than anything else for the ancient stoics and in stoicism and therefore doing good is a fundamental practice of stoicism Right. I would argue if anyone asked me, um, you know, what books should someone who's interested in really practicing Stoicism really wants to become a Stoic themselves, uh, really an adherent of Stoicism, what books should they read? Well, of course, yeah, you want to start with some um, some of the bedrock literature in 
stoicism to learn about what it is about its history but really if you want to be a practicing stoic i would recommend this book that we're talking about today doing good better because um really that's what stoicism was all about uh, and should and should continue to be about today it's about doing the right thing even when it's difficult okay so other points that he makes in the book uh, i think he, he likes to spend the first i would say third of the book making the following point and he makes this he makes this point that often what you think is something that is doing good is not as good as you think okay so he gives some examples let me share some of the examples like disaster relief is not always as good and now it's this is an awkward thing for me to say and i'm also very unqualified unlike the author to really say it especially since like i said i haven't read the book actually you know it was quite a long time ago that i read it but basically if i recall correctly his point was big disasters right you you know i'm thinking about the the earthquakes tsunamis um flooding that you see on the news um they get a lot of media attention they get a ton of media attention and therefore they get usually an outsized response in terms of aid so usually they have enough or more than enough aid very shortly thereafter and therefore your marginal contributions will not be as impactful as uh, other uh, charities at the time so Disaster relief is another example of like, so you, you might think like, oh, wow, there's this really horrible thing going on in the world right now. I must donate. Well, uh, not necessarily, not necessarily. I mean, to contrast that, let's let's go back to the GiveWell's top four charities, right? Uh, one of them is about vitamin A deficiency, right? How often do you flick on the evening news and hear stories about the vitamin A deficiency? that's killing 200,000 children a year, very much preventable. So the point is, uh, if it's newsworthy and grabbing a lot of attention, it may not be really uh, an area where you can do the most good. Okay, another uh, really interesting point, this one really stuck with me from this book, is a concept called earning to give earning to give so this is for anyone really but i think it would really be useful for someone who's you know young in their career and trying to figure out what to do and, and especially obviously for people who want to do good people who are have the motivation to do some good in their lives to help others right um so earning to give is an avenue a path Right. Let me let me try to say this just in really simple terms. If you're a young person coming, you know, just starting out in university and you want to do really good in this world, well, you know, you'd probably be thinking to yourself, I need to work for an NGO. Right. I need to I want to be boots on the ground, working for an NGO, being right there to help people. And in some cases, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And uh, the author's book, eight, uh, sorry, the author's uh, advisory group called 80,000 Hours, they specialize in advising young people and exactly where and how they should go about doing that. But another perfectly valid and often more effective way to do this is to not go boots on the ground and work for an NGO. It's to simply try to earn as much money as you possibly can but donate a sizable percentage of that to charity. So he, he uses the example of a, of a young doctor named Greg who was torn with this very dilemma. Should he work for an organization like uh, Doctors Without Borders, be boots on the ground in the countries, you know, delivering medicine in countries uh, in really the poorest, most uh, most uh, in need countries or and i think greg in this example was from the uk or 
should he continue to work in the UK? And so he did a, a study basically with data uh, to quantify how much good could he do? How many lives could he save? And by the way, there's a there's a metric uh, that's used in this book uh, that I had never heard of before called the quali. Uh, let me just pull up. What is the different definition of a quali again? It's a metric that's used in these spaces, uh, in these effective altruism space. And oh yeah, it's it's a quality adjusted life year. So it's a measure of basically, you could measure a charity in qualities and how well it's doing. And basically you could quantify how many years of people's lives are they going to extend as, uh, as, a, as a result of their work. Okay. So he, this guy, Greg, this young doctor did this and he measured the two outcomes basically, and I'm probably botching the anecdote a little bit, but this is essentially it. He quantified, he quantified, okay, how many qualities, how many lives can I save if I stayed here in the UK and earned X amount of money and donated, let's say 20%, don't he going to donate 20% of a salary uh, every year to the top charity, like the top, top charities that we mentioned, or he goes and he works for an NGO and his work has this incremental effect. And, and then, so he basically worked out that he could have a much greater impact if he uh, remained in the UK and just was a doctor and just tried to make as much money as he could and was very much committed to donating 20%, maybe some years more, uh, even more than that to the most effective charities. So earning to give is something, and I found this was so impactful because for those of us who are already in our careers, we're not super young. We're not starting out making these choices for the first time. Uh, you know, it could be very difficult to switch at this point to NGO work, but guess what? Like all you need to do is just donate some, just donate some. A little or a lot, a little or a lot, depending on how much good you want to do. Uh, but it's, and you know, he gives another example of like, um, you know, very high earning individuals like, you know, Wall Street types or Silicon Valley executives. You know, these guys could do way more, way much more good by earning to give, by giving a set amount of their salary to, uh, the most deserving charities than they would if they were to quit and go off and 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 go to Africa or go to India and be boots on the ground help help there. So I thought that was a very interesting, um, very interesting example. And by the way, he, he also points out that you know this charitable aid work, as long as it's done correctly, and thank thank goodness there are groups like GiveWell that give us reliable data on which charities are doing good because you can't always take your word their word for it right not always some of them you know there are even some nefarious charities out there who are like not doing any good at all they're like basically stealing your money um so thank goodness there are charities like give uh non-profits like give well who do the research for us those of us who don't have the time and expertise to really research this um if we are able to choose the right ones, this charitable aid really does work. And he uses the, the example of the elimination of salt of smallpox as a salient example. So they, they, he cites this as an example of a direct case of a case of aid in the form of like money, Western, you know, developed world donation money. Uh, being put to good use and to having a soup, an amazing impact in the world and the elimination of a leading mortality cause in, in smallpox, totally eliminated off the face of the earth. Okay, so then he gives some more examples of instances in which we should really challenge our thinking about what is doing good, what is not doing good in this world. Um, 
and he gives and this and like here we might get into a little bit slightly controversial he gives the example of sweatshops so there was a time especially in the in the 2000s where uh the media was very uh there were a lot of stories in mainstream media about sweatshops and it was very very much top of everyone's mind textile companies uh would do all that they can to assure their customers that their uh, products were not made in sweatshops sweatshops are basically just defined as you know factories where there are typically you know very long hours perhaps subpar uh, safety standards um yeah, I don't know how, how else to describe them. There's very subpar safety standards, very long hours, sometimes dangerous conditions. Um, but, and, and you think, you know, well, obviously those are horrible. It's horrible. It's like, you know, they're not being paid well. It's dangerous. Um, I think it's, they also get their name because they're usually in uh, hot places like uh, India, Southeast Asia, where it's hot, humid, there may not, there, there's definitely not any air conditioning. Um, but here's the thing. They're not as bad as you think. They're not as bad as you think. In fact, the leading developmental econom, uh, economists all agree that they are a net good in those places. That they are essential for helping those places raise themselves up out of poverty so that till they get to the point where perhaps the conditions will just improve and you know it keeps them away from alternatives that are ter much much worse like prostitution and things like that so just another example like i said in the first sort of third of this book doing good better he tries to really drive home the point that uh what what that looks can be deceiving when it comes to charities, right? Another one was, um, an interesting one was uh, vegetarianism and ethical consumption of, of animals, right? Uh, he talks about how, you know, vegetarianism, is it uh, more ethical? Depends, it depends. It's hard to say. It can be hard to say, right? I mean, if it depends on where you're getting your fruits and vegetables, because you know, anything that's mass produced certainly uh led to the destruction of some animals, either by either by secondary impacts of just a loss of habitat or uh by direct cultivation methods that ends up uh, uh inadvertently killing small animals like mice, snakes, birds. You know, it's hard to say. How many lives are in or per per hundred calories here? It's hard to say. And then when you get to meat, there is uh you know this he 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 I'm not making this up. He describes this in the book. You know how you can quantify maybe how ethical certain animal products are. Like uh, you know a, a cow is one life, and it feeds uh, it provides many 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 meals, whereas a chicken is one life and it provides uh, not so many meals you know uh, and as i mentioned before when he was making the point that things do happen on the margins he talked about how you know uh, here it is let me have to look at my notes here um he talks about if you were to cut out red meat and dairy for one week you achieve a greater reduction in your carbon footprint than you would buying entirely locally sourced food so again he's kind of just trying to challenge the status quo so we should think more intelligently about things because you know there's another one uh, buy local support local locals better for the environment because it doesn't have to be shipped all over the world well that's true that can be true right sure sure support local if you can but if you can't just abstain for a week and it has a measurably greater impact than if you were just buying all uh all uh locally sourced food so it makes the point that there are things we can do within our power that have outsized impact that we don't really realize um so basically all of it suggests that we are biased uh we don't always know what is best uh and we need objective data to help drive us in the right uh direction 
which is why I cannot recommend this book enough. I've not done a super great job, and I've not really, uh, I can't remember the latter half of the book as well, because I remember it. Ta he talks a lot about career choice, but for me, I had already kind of read this earning to give, and was pretty convinced that that's my path, right? Um, so I really recommend the book, and and you know, I was so convinced by the earning to give thing that I was like, you know, I got to figure out ways to uh, make the mindful stoic uh, uh, an instrument of doing some good. So we made it so that most of the products on the mindful stoic store, we donate 20% of the, of the proceeds from those directly to give well. Uh, our founding member subscription fees from the, uh, the pursuit of balance newsletter and podcast, which is just the, the newsletter and pause the podcast associated with the mindful story we donate 50 percent of those to uh give well and because uh, by the way give well like i said they're a research group that they're one of their primary functions is you go to the website you can find the top four charities four charities are doing the most good right now and this can change every year right because maybe conditions improve in one area conditions worsen in another area and uh, you might not see the same four charities on the list every year but that's one of the functions but also you can just give to them directly and they will divert the funds to the areas where according to their research it's needed most so it's kind of like if you give if you give a donation to give well you don't have to think at all as long as you trust their work right i mean go to the website yourself don't take my word for it Go to the website yourself, read the book, Doing Good Better, um, make your own judgment. But if you do trust them, then giving a donation to uh, give well is, is just like making sure it's going to go do the most. It's going to do the most good according to objective data and results. Um, so that's why we're so grateful for their work. That's why... This week on our social channels, we wanted to talk about our mission, talk about how we support GiveWell. Just wanted to spread the word about GiveWell, basically, and this book. Uh, and again, want to make the point that, you know, what does this have to do with stoicism? Uh, I would say everything. It has everything to do with it. Um, you know, you don't. We don't engage in these philosophical practices to become more mindful, more resilient just for the sake of it, just for ourselves. It's not a selfish endeavor, any of this, right? We do it so that we can be strong ourselves first so that we can help others. And once we get to a point in our lives where we're in a position to help others, these are really good resources to have at hand. The book Doing Good Better by William McCaskill and the nonprofit organization called GiveWell, which researches and, and, and tells you about the best charities, the most effective charities. One of which is the Against Malaria Foundation, for which we have the fundraiser going on the Instagram Live. Um, so if anyone is uh, willing or able to support that, it would be much appreciated. So thank you for tuning in. I'm going to log off here now. I uh, These book club, live book clubs are, are really fun. Hopefully I can find time to do them more often. They're pretty few and far between. I have a pretty busy schedule. But I hope I'll try to do some more of them soon. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching. Uh, and again, I'll see you, see you next time for the next one.